Uh, today we're going to focus on uh, relationships, and we might talk about it another time or two. Um, but I just want you to begin just right now to think about the relationships you have. Uh, what kind of relationships are you in? Uh, maybe family relationships, uh, friends, work, school, um, loving relationships, maybe not so loving, uh, difficult, faithful, unfaithful uh, what kind of relationships do you find yourself in uh, these days? Uh, the, the front of this says, relationships enrich life. Uh, do you believe that? Do they? Some do, uh, you may say. Maybe some don't. Um, well, that's what we're going to take a look at today. So let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for being a God who is in relationship with us, not a distant God, but a God that is close, a God that walks with us, a God that never leaves us nor forsakes us. So may we decrease and may you increase, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in our sight, O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer, amen. Uh, some of you, as I look at here, are, are older than me, and some of you are, are younger than, than I am. And so I'll just tell you, where I grew up, the neighborhood that I grew up in, on 709 Elizabeth Drive in Orange, California, uh, there were five or six kids in my neighborhood, on my street. Uh, some were a little bit older, some were a little bit younger than I was, and that's who we played with. That's who we hung out with, the kids in my hood, so to speak. Um, some I got along with real well, some I didn't get along with so well. But I had to deal with those folks and those kids. Uh, there was one kid who's always the bully, you know, and he always played the game he wanted to play because he was the biggest and the strongest. And uh, it was always great when he was sick because we got to play other games that we wanted to play, you know. Um, and so uh, when it got time to be Halloween, you dressed up and you went around your neighborhood. Just how, that's how it went. Uh, I didn't go to that neighborhood over there or, or go across town to this neighborhood over here. You just, you went to the people in your hood, homes you knew, uh, those kids you hung out with. That's, that's just kind of where you were. And I noticed uh, when I first had kids, well, things have changed a little bit. Uh, Yes, yes, children, would you like to go in so-and-so's house for a play date? Yes, I would. Okay, let's get in the car, and we're going to drive all the way across town, you know, to play for two or three hours with this child that you get along with. We're not going to take you to someone's, child, someone's house that you don't get along with. We will pick and choose, and you kind of pick and choose who you get along with, and we'll go to those people's homes, no matter where they live. So the neighborhood is not this street or these couple of streets, it's the whole town. We go trick or treating. Well, let's go to this neighborhood because we know everyone in that neighborhood. And then we'll do that for a little bit. And then whose house would you like to go to next? Well, we know these people, who live over here and we know a few families over there, so we'll drive over there and not knock trick or treat, hey, good to see you, you know? And then we get in the car and then we'll drive over here. Our relationships these days are kind of based on who we get along with. What about the people we don't get along with? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. I have found it to be a very fascinating tool, uh, especially with preaching, uh, to find out what is the world thinking. And that's the internet and Google, especially Google. Um, not an advertisement for Google, it's just what I use. Um, but I like to go onto Google and I like to go uh, type in a, you know, a word or two and then go under images and then see all these pictures that come up about whatever that subject matter might be. Now, be sure that you have on your moderate safe search on your website so you don't get all sorts of images that you don't want. Um, so I typed in this week, relationships. Well, see what comes up. Well, here's someone being very satirical. It's a guy in the middle of the desert. It says, relationships. Sure, there are plenty of other fish in the sea, 
but you're not anywhere near the sea. You're in the desert alone. Okay? I found this one to be fascinating. This broken glass. What does it say? Relationships are like glass. Sometimes it's better to leave them broken than try to hurt yourself by putting it back together. Fascinating. Oh, here's a wonderful relationship. <laughs> uh, 72 days? Really? Wow. Let's move on. I love this. It's, uh, it says me. It's got a dotted line around the letter M. It says relationships. Number one, cut on the dotted line. Number two, rotate 180 degrees. So the M becomes a W. Get it? <laughs> I thought to myself, they'll get this. I, I, don't, I won't have to explain it. So the me becomes we, see, okay. Oh boy. First service got it, first service got it. Oh, Facebook. Is this just fascinating, those of us who are on Facebook? This social networking that goes on, names pop up of people I hadn't thought about in years and wow, I can be their friend. They can be my friend. And since I'm a pastor, I can't say no to anyone who requests my friendship. <laughs> So I have 889 friends and I, I don't even know who half of them are. It's, a, it's amazing, uh, all these connections. It has been fun to get reconnected with people you hadn't seen in years and, and to stay connected with people that you really do want to stay connected with. Uh, I saw this cartoon. It's a funeral. There's only a few, couple of people here. It says he had over 2,000 Facebook friends. I was expecting a bigger turnout. Um, <laughs> Don't you love this? Texting, this couple, how was your day? Good, and yours? I mean, they're right across the table from each other. I find this amazing. I had lunch with someone one day um, and he was having an argument with his wife through texting. For 30 minutes, I just sat there, just eating my food. He's just like, oh, come on! Da, 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 da. So ridiculous. Da, 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 da. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Really? You're arguing through texting? You have 150 characters. Really just use texting for, are you gonna be there? Yes. What time? Four o'clock. Okay, thanks. That's all texting should be used for. Don't try to have an argument through texting. Don't tell your spouse you're having, filing for divorce through texting. I mean, it's just, it's just ama it's amazing to me what people use texting for. Here's a couple, aren't they a striking couple? Looks so nice and happy. One moment you're in relationships, everything's going well, everything's perfect, you're in sync. And then the next moment, what is she thinking, you know? Reminds me of that story of that guy who God came to him and said, I'll grant you one wish, any wish you want in the whole wide world. And the man said, I would like a highway all the way from Los Angeles to Hawaii. Really? That's your wish? Yes, that's my wish. I don't like to fly or go by boat. I can drive all the way to Hawaii. I think that would be great. God said, that'd be awfully expensive. It's incredibly long and difficult permits, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Do you have another wish? I would like to know the mind of a woman. God said, two lanes or four, you know. <laughs> This great mystery, you know? How about this couple? Boy, I, I am, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. And uh, hey, I, I've had a failed marriage. Uh, I've been through a divorce. And, it, and I stand up here and couples come down the aisle or the bride comes down the aisle and the couple's here. And we, we, you know, we go through the ceremony. We turn them around. And let me introduce to you, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. And the friends and the family who are gathered around just go crazy. They're excited. They're happy. The couple's happy. Wow. Every, and then three years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, this is what they look like. What happens to that relationship? How does it just go sideways? Boy, I mean, it does. Uh, it's happened to me. Oh, there's faith in Joshua. You have family relationships. You have brothers and sisters. How do you get along with them? 
You know, this lasted for about 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> you know? And then there we are. Hey, we're a happy family. We're, Joshua's like holding on. We're stuck together. We are together. We will be together. Here's King Saul. Israel has been under God's reign for 10,000, oh, 10, 1,000 years. And God's been their king. And as Israel has grown up and matured and moved here and there, and, uh, they start noticing other countries have kings. And this king, oh, look at his sword and look at his spear and look at that big old white horse. They got a king. And pretty soon Israel's like, we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. And God's like, ah, I'm not sure that's a good idea. And Samuel, who is the judge, who's kind of the leader at the time, says, God, I, I'm not sure it's a good idea. And, and God says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, says, okay, that's what they want. Let's give them what they want. And so Saul is uh, made king, the people's choice. The scriptures say that he was a head taller than anybody else. So pretty, pretty tall guy. Uh, reminds me of, of Warren G. Harding, uh, president of the United States. Uh, it was whatever year that was that he was elected, 22, maybe somewhere around there. Um, the Republican Party was trying to figure out which of their six candidates would represent the GOP. And uh, Warren G. Harding was in sixth place. He was the worst candidate. But someone in a smoke-filled room, which is this is where the term smoke-filled room comes from, in the back smoke-filled room of the Republican leaders at that time, sat around thinking, this will be the first year that women get to vote. Of the six candidates, Warren G. Harding is the tallest. He's the best looking. He looks the most presidential. Let's nominate him. Warren G. Harding won in a landslide. And he is considered to be the United States' worst president in its history. Is this what you want? That's what we want. That's what you got. So it is with Saul. Coming to be inauguration day. And the announcer, the MC says, ladies and gentlemen, people of Israel, our first king, King Saul. King Saul. Where is he? No one can find him. Uh, need a search party, <laughs> go out and find King Saul. So they go out, he's hiding like behind the drum set. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, I just didn't want to go out there. Didn't want to meet the people. Didn't want to make a speech. You know, this is the guy. This is who we're electing. This is the guy. So King Saul becomes the king. Wars inevitably come during this time. And if you can imagine Po Valley, you ever been out to Po Valley? There's a North Po Valley Road and there's a South Po Valley Road. And on the North Po Valley Road are the Philistines and on the South Po Valley Road are the Israelites. And right in the middle every day for 40 days, Goliath would come out from North Po Valley Road, stand in the middle of the valley and say, bring it on. This is the way it's gonna work. You bring your best warrior, I'm our best warrior. We'll fight to the death. Whoever wins, wins the battle. Your team wins. 40 days, you come out there, mock God, mock Israel, say all sorts of things. And one day, a little boy named David goes over there and says, what is going on? Now, of course, the backstory is Samuel has gotten a word from the Lord to go to David's family, Jesse. Jesse is the dad. He tells, Samuel tells Jesse, um, I need to meet your sons because one of them is going to be anointed king. And so Jesse brings out his sons, all like eight of them, just da 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 And Samuel walks up to the firstborn son, sees he's the tallest, he's the best looking. So obviously this has got to be the king, the next king. And God says, no, that's not him. Well, how about the second son? No, third, fourth, no, 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 no. 
And he gets all the way down the end the, all, to all the sons. And, and Samuel says, Jesse, it's none of these, it's none of these sons. And I, I love this. Do you have any other sons? <laughs> and Samuel's like, oh, that's right, I do. How does he forget that he has a son? Do you forget you have children? I, sometimes I want to forget, but I mean, it's really, you forgot you had a son? Oh, that's right, David's out in the field. Oh, hold on a second. Run to David, come on, come on in here. Walks up, he's like 10 or 12 years old. I mean, he's just a little guy. And Samuel says, he's the one. God doesn't look on the outside, God looks on the inside, looks at the heart. So back to Goliath, David walks up with bread and cheese for his brothers, he's like, who's this guy? Well, that's Goliath. Oh, I could take him. You know how teenagers are, oh, I could take him. Oh, you know, they don't know any different. So he approaches King Saul and says, hey, I think I can take on the king. I've, I've, I've battled lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, I mean, you know, come on, I can do this. And Saul's like, okay, put on this armor. So he puts on the armor. He's like, I can't move. Take the armor off me. I don't need all that armor. I, I've got my slingshot. I've got some stones here. That's all I need. David walks out there to stand before King Goliath or the Goliath. Goliath is like, Really? This is what you're bringing to the table? This little boy, I will just chew him up for dinner and throw him to the dogs. And so David's like, bring it on. So he he starts running, takes out a slingshot, boom, nails Goliath right in the head. Goliath falls down. David runs over, takes out the sword. I love this part of the story. Chops off his head, pulls it up, says, hey, Philistines, check it out. And the Israelites are rejoicing and they overtake the Philistines. So, come back into town. The women are going crazy because Saul's killed thousands, but David has killed tens of thousands. And so it goes every time David returns from war. Saul, thousands, David, tens of thousands. You've got two kings in the same court. Guess what happens? It doesn't work so well. So you have this wonderful picture of King Saul with his large spear, but you don't see the other half of the picture, and that's David. Saul makes several attempts on David's life. Throws a spear at him numerous times, misses every time. So here we have this difficult relationship. And there's a time in the storyline when David is on the run from King Saul that David is in a cave hiding from King Saul and King Saul comes into the cave to go to the bathroom. And while he's going to the bathroom, David sneaks up behind him and cuts off a bit of King Saul's robe. And a couple of days later when King Saul is across the valley calling out David, David goes out and says, where do you think I got this? I had you, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Why didn't David, oh, why didn't David take advantage of the situation? It's because of this verse right here. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head, on Saul's head, and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? David says, you are the anointed one. I can't. I can't kill you. I can't kill the Lord's anointed. Even though as much trouble as you're causing in my life, you're in my life for a reason and for a purpose. Don't quite understand it, but I can't take you out. Do you have any souls in your life? First service, a wife looked at her husband. I'm like, no, don't do that now. Don't. Who are the souls in your life? Might be in your family, might be at your workplace, might be in your neighborhood. People you just don't get along with. And yet they're in your life. And so I think what I'd like to, for us to begin thinking about, I'm not sure we'll get our hands wrapped around it today. What if those people are the Lord's anointed? God's put them in your life for a reason. They're there for a purpose. 
may not understand what it is, may not like it, but they're there. See, going back to the beginning of the sermon, you know, we live in a world that we're very disposable with our relationships. Eh, I don't get along with you very well. Bye. I do get along with you for now, so let's be friends. And eh, now you said something I don't like, so I throw you to the side. Where, you know, whereas before, when I, at least when I was growing up, you stuck with the people you were with, whether you liked them or not. That was your neighborhood. Those were the people. Those were the Lord's anointed around you. There's a great word in our Christian vocabulary called providence. What providence means is that God's hands, literally his hands, are in our world, working amongst us and within us and with us and whatnot, and ordering events and things. He is not a God who sits back well, I can't believe that happened. Wow, I'm surprised by that. Uh-oh, oh no, oh, I can't believe that happened. Look at that. Did you see that? Didn't see that one coming. That's not the God we worship. It's a God who's just in our lives, putting things together, mixing things up and bringing these people into our life, moving, you know, doing all that. And I, you know, I have no problems with that. I love that about our God because I love the people that God's brought into my life. But boy, there's some certain circumstances and situations. I'm like, oh, I don't quite get this. I don't understand why this child's being physically abused. Can't understand why this person died by a drive-by shooting. That makes no sense to me. Why did God allow that to happen? I don't know. It doesn't deter me from believing and trusting in God and in his infinite wisdom. So the next time we think about people in our life who, lives who are like Saul's, perhaps we can think of them as maybe they're the Lord's anointed. Maybe they're supposed to be. Maybe Ellie has something to say about this subject on the matter. So I'm gonna try and start looking at people differently. Because I like to be around people that I get along with I don't necessarily find great joy in hanging out with people I don't get along with. There's some of you that drive me crazy. You know who you are. <laughs> but what if the reason these people are in my life, they're like sandpaper. You know how that goes. They just, God, they just rub you. just like, ah! But maybe they're the sandpaper in my life to smooth out the rough edges of my life to make me smooth. So smooth that it becomes a polish. And I polish it so smooth that I become reflective of God's love, of God's grace. Maybe that's why they're in my life. So I can truly reflect the glory of God in all that I am and in all that I do. I love the fact that God is, is at work in our lives and how he brings us together. How, does he bring, how did he bring the four of us together? Me and Julie, Faith and Joshua. I'm adopted. Julie's mom is adopted. Faith is adopted. Joshua's pretty natural. How did all that work? I don't know but it's God at work. And he's placed different people in our lives, some Saul's and some David's in our world, in our life, in such a way that brought us together, brought you together, brought all of us together here today so that we could ultimately reflect the glory and the wonder of the God we love and the God who loves us so much. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, for, for your providence, for your hand in our world, the souls of our lives help us to view them through a different lens that perhaps they are the Lord's anointed, 
in our life for a reason. To allow us to shine and reflect your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe that everybody in our lives is there for a reason. That God put everybody in our lives, whether we like them or we don't, they're there for a reason. I also want to go on record by saying that this is not an anti-tall person campaign today. If you're tall, that's okay. Tall people are good. I invite you to stand up, grab the hand of the Saul next to you. I mean, the person next to you. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming out today, and I hope you're going to have a marvelous week. And uh, please pray for our... Belizers are our folks going to Belize. Uh, they'll be leaving on some Wednesday morning, some Wednesday night. Uh, so uh, pray for them. Uh, kept you a little long today, so I'll, I'll miss seeing you at the front door because it just gets too jam-packed if I do. So. so let's go forth in the world in peace and be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Uh, render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Love and serve the Lord with gladness and with joy honor all people, and laugh often, and fear not, and go forth knowing that the love of God the Father Almighty, the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship, the power of the Holy Spirit is with you now and forever. And everyone said, amen. amen. Go get them.